Hey, what's going on, friends? Thanks for tuning in. I'm going to go through the instrument ACS right now so you can be thoroughly overprepared and impress your DPE on your check ride. First off, thanks for watching my video. Statistically, 85% of you watching are not subscribed, so if I'm able to add any value to your life through this episode, please do me a favor and subscribe to the channel, and I appreciate you guys liking and commenting as well. All right, let's begin with a complete mock oral instrument check ride. All right, so we're going to start off with pilot qualifications, which is IRIAK1. I'm not going to say the full name for every single one, but we're just going to start off with K1. You can follow with your ACS, and I'm going to go ahead and outline it here for visual reference. So K1 is qualifications, certification, and recency. What are the hour qualification requirements for an instrument pilot? Your DP is probably going to ask you, hey, show me that you're eligible for this check ride. The hours consist of 50 hours of cross-country as PIC, 40 hours of simulated or actual instrument time, of which 15 hours with an instructor, cross-country flight of 250 nautical miles or more with an instructor, and have had three different kinds of approaches. In order to apply for an instrument rating, you must have already had your private pilot certificate or be concurrently applying for a private pilot certificate with your instrument rating, which most people are probably not doing that. You have to also be able to read, speak, write, and understand the English language. So what are the recency of experience requirements? You must have had a flight review and to carry passengers, three takeoffs and landings in the preceding 90 days in the same category, class, and type. That flight review must have been done in the last two years. And you must have to fly instruments to act as PIC, six hits within six months have six instrument approaches holds proceed hold procedures and tasks intercepting and tracking courses through the use of navigation systems and can be done in an aircraft or a simulator you can find this in 61157 for this if you go past the six months then you can fly with a safety pilot to be current again or if you go past 12 months then you must have an ipc an instrument proficiency check with a double i or a dpe or anyone that is approved to do that for you from the FAA. Although, if you are going to use a simulator for recency, a CFII must be present with you. Let's move on to Kilo 2, Privileges and Limitations. Commercial without an instrument cannot carry passengers further than 50 nautical miles or at night. This is on 61133B1, and you must file a flight plan and receive a clearance, and you can't legally accept and file an IFR clearance without an instrument rating. This is on 91173. Kilo 3 covers Part 68 Basic Med Privileges and Limitations. Pilots flying under Basic Med are allowed to operate covered aircraft defined as having a maximum certificated takeoff weight of not more than 6,000 pounds and are not authorized to carry more than six occupants at altitudes up to 18,000 feet MSL. For this, you can remember 6, 6,000, 18,000. Pilots can fly an IFR under basic med. So if your DP asks you, hey, you have basic med, let's say you do, are you legal to fly IFR? Romeo 3 will be proficiency versus currency. What is the difference? Proficient means that you're capable of conducting a task with a high degree of competence, and currency means that you have performed the minimum FAA requirements within the allotted time frame required to carry out a specific set of duties. Your examiner is probably going to ask you about this. If you're proficient, he's going to give you a scenario. It is up to you to decide whether you're proficient or if currency is enough. Obviously, he's going to want you to explain that you must be proficient or that proficiency is very important. Romeo 2 is failure to set personal minimums. Your IFR minimums can depend based on what type of aircraft you fly, if you have an autopilot, if you don't have an autopilot, if you limit yourself to only flying with a safety pilot or with a double I, it can all depend. So please make sure that you go through and that you figure out what your personal minimums are. If you have no idea how to set that up, be sure to ask your CFI and ask for what do you think are some good general guidelines or just look at the ones you had for your private pilot and maybe make them a little more considerate for IFR flying. Romeo 3, failure to ensure fitness and psychological factors that may affect a pilot's ability to fly IFR. For this, just remember I'm safe. Be able to explain to your examiner that if you're going through a rough time at work with your significant other, if something bad has happened to you, that you're not going to let that 
affect you and that you're not going to make a flight that can affect you emotionally, physically, and overall something that could be happening in your life that could translate to your IFR flight. Romeo 4 covers flying unfamiliar airplanes or operating with unfamiliar flight display systems and avionics. The way I think a DPE would phrase this is, sure, you're legal to fly a 172 with a six pack, but if you were trained only with a G1000, then it would probably be unwise without any additional training or endorsements to fly a six pack that you do so if all of your training is with, for example, a G1000, which would obviously go back to the proficiency versus currency requirement. Your DPE might ask you, when is an instrument required? This is part of S1, which is when in IFR flight conditions or conditions less than VFR, class alpha airspace, special VFR at night, and carrying passengers in greater distances of 50 nautical miles at, or at night for hire. For miscellaneous, what information must a PIC have before your flight? 91103 states the acronym NW Craft, or not necessarily states it, but this is how people like to remember it. NOTAMs, weather, known air traffic control delays, runway lengths, alternates, fuel, takeoff and landing distances of airports of intended use. What is RAIM and how can you check if it's working? Receiver Autonomous Integrity Monitoring is a self-monitoring system to ensure adequate signal coverage at all times. If coverage lapses, the system alerts the pilots and you would use flight service station or a third-party interface as well as the receiver's installed RAIM prediction tool. Finally, we'll talk about VOR checks. So what records do you have to keep after a VOR check? That's going to be date, place, bearing error, and signature. It's pretty easy to remember. Just remember, you can find this in 91171 Bravo. Uh, it'll be a plus four minus degree error for a VOT signal, VOR checkpoint, or a dual VOR check. And it's a plus or minus six degree error if you're airborne checkpoints or along an airway. All right, let's move on to section B, which is weather information. We're going to start off with Kilo 1, which is obtaining weather briefings. Your examiner is going to ask you, okay, how did you come up with a weather briefing today, or where would you get your weather from? For this, personally, I would say for flight, that's what I used to get all my weather briefings. He may ask you, okay, where does for flight obtain the briefings? or where does whatever you're using to source your weather, where do they get their information from? Be sure that you're able to explain this. If you don't know, ask your instructor. He or she will probably know the answer to that question or will tell you how to figure that out or how to reference it. This also ties into Kilo 2, which is acceptable weather products and resources. For IRIB K3 Alpha, which is atmospheric composition and stability, all the way down to frost on kilo three kilo you should know what these things are back from your private pilot training if you don't know what these things are definitely be sure to brush up on these and ask your instructor to ask you questions as these things will definitely be tailored to you especially if you got these things wrong on your written exam your examiner is going to want you to understand and be able to explain wind shear how it develops what happens if you are on final approach and you're right above the runway with your Aunt Sally and you experience wind shear, what are you gonna do? Be able to explain how thunderstorms develop, the stages, how far you have to be from them, be able to explain the different types of frost, which ones are worse than others, the severity levels. You never know what you're gonna be asked. This is definitely gonna be tailored to you. So just run through a few scenarios with your instructor before your check ride. Let's move on to Romeo 1, which is the risk management area. Your DPE will probably give you a scenario with your flight plan and say, hey, this has popped up. Can we go or can we not go? Be able to explain that situation or that scenario in a promptly manner to your examiner. Remember that if you get stumped, you can always reference the PHAC, which I have outlined in the instrument annotated ACS, which is in the link in the description. So for risk management, Romeo 2, Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie, limitations of onboard weather equipment. For this, you can use Nexrad. Uh, it can be old as old as 15 minutes, and in severe conditions, it can be dangerous because a lot can happen in 15 minutes. Depending on if your aircraft is equipped with Nexrad, which is part of the G1000 system, my aircraft does not. But if it does, and you're flying with the G1000, lucky you, 
then be able to explain that. All of the following can be out of date in severe weather conditions as well. Proc charts, weather briefings, METARs and TAFs, and uh, radar currency as well if you're in a mountainous area. For Sierra 2, selecting an alternate. So you're going to be asked about alternates for sure on your instrument check ride, so be prepared for this. Just remember, no alternates is if required if the 123 rule is met which is for at least one hour before to one hour after the ETA, the ceiling must be greater than 2,000 AGL and the visibility should be greater than three statute miles. You can see this at 91-169 and for this you can also go on Flight Insights IFR alternate airport requirement video. I really suggest that if you have a hard time understanding this. I did at first, but it's very simple to understand, and he does a great job at explaining it. So remember that for a precision approach at your alternate, you need weather to be at least 602, and non-precision is 802. In reality, a pilot can select any suitable airport on the fly as your alternate, and you're not required to go to the airport in your flight plan. This is something that I've heard a lot of people mess up on on their check ride when they ask, okay, do you have to go to your filed alternate? Not necessarily, it's only for fuel planning purposes, and if there's an aircraft that's nearby that you can fly to that's VFR or at or above the 123 rule, then you can use that as your alternate if you're on a whim. The thing you have to consider, I just reviewed this with my instructor the other day, are alternate GPS considerations. If your alternate has a GPS approach, then you have to consider WAS versus a non-WAS GPS. WAS can be at either destination or alternate, but not at both. And then a WAS with a Barrow VNAV. LNAV VNAV can be used at both destination and alternate. And then a WAS equipped GPS without Barrow VNAV. LNAV can be used at both destination and alternate. This can get very confusing, so if you don't understand that, please make sure you ask your instructor. That's why they're there to help you prepare. Let's transition more or less back into weather. So warm and cold fronts. Again, I'm going over the basics, but I want to go through this because I'm going to listen to this myself to prepare myself for the check ride. I'm just happen to be uploading it on YouTube to help others out that find this information useful. Cold fronts. The cold front itself commonly brings a narrow band of precipitation. Okay, cold front equals a narrow band of precipitation commonly that follows along the leading edge of a cold front. These bands of precipitation can be very strong and bring severe thunderstorms, hailstorms, squalls or tornadoes warm fronts are a series of warmer air rising over a layer of sub freezing air and it may result in the formation of freezing rain or freezing drizzle as you approach the front the cloud layer builds quickly and the clear air between layers rapidly disappears as the cold front passes expected weather can include stratiform clouds drizzle low ceilings poor visibility variable winds and a rise in temperature. Let's review SIGMETs, AIRMETs, and the types of weather reports. For SIGMETs, just know that weather is hazardous to all aircraft. It is over an area of widespread severe weather and will generally include convective activity like vo volcanic ash. An AIRMET contains weather information that is pertinent to most aircraft, okay, not just general aviation, but most, this is a common misconception, and the conditions are more moderate than a SIGMET. There are three types of AIRMETs, which is Tango, Sierra, and Zulu. I chopped this up in my private pilot ACS review, but of course I've come back and refreshed on it. There's Tango, Sierra, Zulu. Tango is turbulence and winds over 30 knots. Tango, think turbulence. Sierra is IFR conditions. Think Sierra for C, it's IFR, can't see. Zulu is freezing levels and icing conditions. Thank you again to the person who commented and brought that up. The different types of weather reports include METARs, TAFs, area forecasts, temperature and winds alofts, and center weather advisories. These are generally things that you want to look at before initializing an IFR flight. A METAR is a routine report for a specific location and a time, not necessarily a forecast, just a report. A TAF is a forecast for a specific airport, and an area forecast is a forecast for a much larger area. Temperature and winds alofts gives favorable altitude in areas of possible icing. This is generally what you want to look for when you're flight planning to see the best winds and to see the temperatures. 
Center weather advisories are an aviation warning for use by air crews to anticipate and avoid adverse weather while en route. Let's talk about the other aviation weather charts that come up, for example, on foreflight that you might have to brief to your examiner. A surface analysis chart is a surface level weather observation and it depicts low pressure, high pressure, and fronts. The significant weather prog chart provides a forecast of aviation weather hazards for pre-flight briefings. And then the convective outlook chart provides a graphical outlook for severe weather in the week ahead. Let's talk about the types of icing. So there are two types of icing. It's gonna be structural and induction. The structural kinds are clear, which are generally found in cumuliform clouds. Rime is found in stratified clouds generally, and mixed is found in both. Induction can be carb icing. This is very dangerous, and this could happen to you if you forget to use your carb heat. So be sure you can explain how that works in your aircraft. If you have a carburetor, there are newer Cessnas that are mostly fuel injected and they do not have a carburetor. So be sure that you can understand and thoroughly explain how the icing systems or the de-icing systems rather work in your aircraft because your DP is going to want to make sure that you understand the hazards of ice and you know how to mitigate the risks of icing. You may be asked, what are the categories of icing? There's trace, very minimal amounts, hence the name trace, light, moderate, and severe. So you may be asked, during your pre-flight, what kind of information should you be aware of? You should be aware of fronts, their type, speed, direction of movement, also cloud layers, freezing levels, air temperature and pressure, as well as precipitation. In general, if you experience low pressure, it could be more conducive to icing, and precipitation could also avoid icing, like freezing rain. You may be asked, how can you mitigate the risk of encountering ice during your pre-flight? Well, you can consider the aircraft climb performance and the route's minimum altitude. Weight will also affect the aircraft's ability to fly in icing, as well as if you're able to climb or descend under or above the MEA of your proposed route, be able to give yourself a bit of a safety cushion so you're not stuck at an altitude because you're unable to climb or descend. Also understand that icing can increase drag and understand that that can have an impact on your overall fuel consumption. And going back to affecting your aerodynamics, you may have to come in at a faster approach speed or a faster indicated airspeed that way you are able to land safely. All right, that will conclude the weather portion. If, again, if you guys have any questions, just leave them down below and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Let's start with cross-country flight planning. For kilo one of the cross-country flight planning portion, for the knowledge areas, kilo one, kilo two, kilo three, kilo three alpha, kilo three bravo, kilo three charlie, kilo four, and kilo five, these are all basic private pilot topics that we already covered in the last video of the ACS review. For this, I suggest that if you fly a 172 like I do, which is the only plane I can speak for, to download the blue 172 performance app on the Apple Store. You can do all of your weight and balance, time and route, calculations, and you can also use ForeFlight. There's some great guides on YouTube out there. I suggest the DPE Seth Lake. He has a good video on how to set up a weight and balance profile on ForeFlight. So that's what I would use for your time, climb, descent rates, distances, headings, true air speeds, ground speeds. As I said, I already covered this in my previous ACS video with the private pilot. I went through it a lot more. It's a longer video. But this video is strictly for IFR flying because I don't want to waste my time and I don't want to waste anyone else's time. We will go ahead and jump to Kilo 4, which is obviously elements of an IFR flight plan, which is not like VFR flying at all. The elements of an IFR flight plan include the aircraft identification, flight rules and type of flight, number and types of aircraft and wake turbulence category, equipment, departure, aerodome, estimated off block time, cruising speed, cruising level, route to be followed, destination, total estimated elapsed time of flight, alternate fuel endurance, total number of persons on board, emergency and survival equipment and other information. You can find this in your four flight, just hit file and then you can scroll through it and really see everything that you can input into there. There's also a video on flight planning by Flight Insight who he provides a fantastic amount of knowledge on there about flight planning. Now, 
Sierra 1, Sierra 2, Sierra 3, and Sierra 4 are all very similar. So Sierra 1, prepare and present a flight plan, recalculate fuel reserves, simulate filing the plan, and interpret arrival, departure, en route, and approach procedures using charts. This can all be done on ForeFlight. I strongly suggest that you use ForeFlight if you're not using it. Maybe you're using Garbin Pilot, which I've never used or know how to use. So if you're using that and you have a way of doing that, awesome. Just be sure to go over it with your instructor before your check ride. Sierra 5 is recognize simulated wind contamination and demonstrate mitigation of risk. So for example, if your DP says, oh, well, you're flying along and you start to accumulate ice, what can you do? Well, you can reduce the angle of attack by increasing the speed. If you're turning, you can roll the wings level and maintain your altitude. If the flaps are extended, you might not want to retract them unless it's determined that it, the upper surface of the wing is clear of ice. Again, in my case, I'm flying a 172, so I can't see above the wing. Sierra 6, apply pertinent information from charts, supplements, and notums. In this case, your DP is probably going to want to see that you're able to read, interpret, and explain charts, supplements, and notums. He may pick a random airport and say, you know, is this, is this important for our flight today? Or is this going to affect a go or no-go decision? Or is this going to affect the possibility of using this airport as an alternate? When planning on using a GPS for IFR, if WAS is on board, you don't require any additional equipment. For a non-WAS equipped GPS, you must have an approved alternate with required checks completed, like VOR checks. Active monitoring is not required if the GPS uses RAM. Now, for flight plans, you must have prior to departure when operating in controlled airspace. Air traffic control automatically deletes flight plans in the system after two hours, and the pilot can cancel when in VFR conditions outside of class alpha airspace. Alrighty, let's move on to pre-flight procedures. Airplane system related to IFR operations. I'm going to thoroughly go over systems because this is very important for instrument flying. Knowledge area Kilo 1 is how to prevent icing and understand how this can form in your aircraft and understand how it can affect your aircraft. Now, every aircraft is different, so I'm just going to go through the 172. So in the 172, we have the pedo, the pedo heat and we have carb heat. That's about it in my particular aircraft. I have a 1978 Cessna 172 November model. If you're flight training in a Cirrus, you're flight training in a Piper, or you're flight training in a DA, I could not tell you what is in that. So be sure you brush up on that and go through that with your instructor. Let's talk about the pedostatic system operation and limitations. The pedostatic system runs the airspeed, altimeter, and vertical speed indicator by measuring the pressure differential, or the airspeed, or the pressure at a given altitude by your altimeter and vertical speed indicator. The limitations are as follows. If the pedo tube is blocked, the airspeed will read lower than when you go higher and vice versa. If the static port is blocked, then the opposite will happen to the airspeed indicator. Again, for your aircraft, if you have a G1000 system, be able to explain what all of that system does and how it communicates with one another, as well as your electrical system as this differs from plane to plane. And of course, how you would go about operating with in-op items. And for example, you may be asked, oh, well, we go out to fly today and you realize that your fuel tanks are both reading empty. Can we fly today? Obviously not okay, we can't fly, what would you go about doing? Okay, well, I would put an in-op sticker on those gauges and talk to a mechanic. So be sure that you're able to explain that process. Operating with inoperative equipment is on 91.213. Now we're gonna get into airplane flight instruments and navigation equipment. Now, this is primarily what instrument flying is all about. So this entire section is going to be solely about GPS, navigation, and aircraft systems. All right, so we're gonna go over the pitch, bank, and power instruments. So pitch is gonna be your airspeed, attitude indicator, altimeter, and your vertical speed indicator. Your bank instruments are gonna be attitude indicator, heading indicator, and turn coordinator. And your power instruments are gonna be the airspeed, tachometer, and the manifold pressure. One of the most important instruments that you have in your aircraft is gonna be your magnetic compass. It's a direction-seeking instrument it's in a self-contained unit, so it cannot fail, and it aligns itself with magnetic field using simple magnets, and it's filled with kerosene fluid, and it does not freeze. At the end of the day, all instruments can fail, so don't take my word on that, but it's very difficult to have a magnet fail on you. The magnetic compass errors is deviation, variation, and magnetic dip. So deviation is going to be interference with metal components. You can try this out by putting your iPad 
up to the compass and be aware that your DP might actually do this to you. I had this happen to me on my private pilot check ride. We were flying and my DP distracted me and pointed out some cows or something that we were flying over and he put his iPad up there and said, what heading are we flying? Why is the magnet looking like that? And I saw his iPad and I said, oh, that's magnetic deviation. So that's from the internal magnetic fields in the aircraft's electrical systems. Variation is going to be the angle difference between true north and magnetic north. And then magnetic dip is magnets in a compass. They try to point 3D towards an Earth's magnetic pole. For the north and south turning errors, it's going to be undershoot north, overshoot south. People like to remember UNOS. And then acceleration and deceleration errors is accelerate north, decelerate south, which is ANDS. And this only occurs on an east and a westerly heading. Now that we're on the topic of compass turnings and overshooting and undershooting, remember that your standard rate turns for 3 degrees per second is going to be 2 minutes for a 360, 1 minute for a 180, and 30 seconds will be 90 degrees. If this is 1 second per 3 degrees, which would be equivalent to a standard rate turn. Alright, let's actually get into the aircraft systems themselves. We already briefly went over the pitot-static instruments, but I want to get more into the vacuum systems. The reason being is because the vacuum system is the most important system when instrument flying. So if you experience a vacuum failure, usually your attitude and your heading indicator will fail. And if this happens, be sure to utilize your auxiliary vacuum pump if that's available to you in your plane. Remember your gyroscopic instruments are going to consist of your attitude indicator, heading indicator, and your turn coordinator. For taxiing, remember that on your attitude indicator should read no more than 5 degrees on taxi turns. So if it's turning more than 5 degrees, you're, you have an issue that you need to correct. I'm going to go back and touch on the G1000 system because a lot of people fly with G1000s, so I didn't want to skip anything on that. So the G1000 system uses a AHRS system or the AHRS system, Attitude Heading Reference System. This includes the attitude indicator, the heading indicator, and the turn coordinator, and it replaces the need for vacuum systems and gyroscopes, so it doesn't use a vacuum system, basically. Internal sensors like the electronic gyroscopes and accelerometers measure the aircraft's attitude in relation to the horizon. The mag magnetometer functions as a magnetic compass without the errors, and it will automatically seek the magnetic north. So the glass cockpit is also made up of the ADC, the air data computer, the PFD, which is your primary flight display, and your MFD, your multifunction display. So the ADC, the air data computer, will include the airspeed indicator, altimeter, vertical speed indicator, and it takes information from the pitot tube and it takes it to the primary flight display. And the PFD, the primary flight display, will show all of your primary instruments condense into one area so that it can simplify your workload and your scan. And your MFD, your multifunction display, will give you information such as maps, charts, and other gauges. When it comes to the instrument flight deck check, we're going to start off with Kilo 1, which is purpose of performing an instrument flight deck check and how to detect possible defects. So while you're taxiing on your check ride, make sure that your instruments are as follow. Your compass moves freely, your airspeed indicator reads zero, your VSI reads zero, your heading indicator follows closely or matches the compass, your turn coordinator turns into a bank, and the ball slips outside of the turn, as in the ball turns opposite of the direction you're turning in, and the clock is functioning with the second hand ticking. IFR airworthiness to include airplane inspection requirements and required equipment for IFR flight, that's going to be your A tomato flames grab card for IFR day, A tomato flames flaps and grab card for IFR night, and that's going to be it for instrument flight deck check. All you have to know, everything else is going to be situational based when it comes to risk management. TC clearances and procedures. So A is compliance with ATC clearances. So Kilo 1 pilot responsibility is going to be on departure, announce takeoff and departure in non-towered airports. So if you're at a non-towered airport, be sure that you do not take off without a clearance. I was with my instructor the other day and I accidentally did that. He was just smiling, waiting to see if I'd catch up and I did not and I took off without a clearance. So announce your takeoff and departure if you are at a non-towered airport. Most of you are probably going to be at a towered airport as you're going to be at a flight school. Contact approach after liftoff. 
for example, approach, blah, 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 is with you at 2,000, climbing 3,000. And then en route, be listening to the appropriate frequency at all times. Don't get left behind on the wrong frequency if you're told you're approved for a frequency change. Read back and comply with all instructions and clearances. Acknowledge and change frequencies as directed. And then for your arrival, be sure that ATC knows what your landing intentions are. If you're coming in for an approach, be sure that they're aware that you're coming in for the RNAV 3.5 left and not for a different approach. Read back and comply with all instructions and clearances, as well as acknowledge and change frequencies as directed for your arrival. You may be thinking, okay, I already know all this, but I'm just making sure you guys all fully understand what is part of the Airman Certification Standards that you're being tested on. Again, you may want to look into void time, which is on 91173. If you can't depart prior to the void time, you must advise air traffic control as soon as possible and state your intentions. The FAA specifically states pilots who depart at or after their clearance void time are not afforded IFR separation and may be in violation of 14 CFR section 91173. So be sure that you brush up on that and that you highlight that in your own ACS. You can reference it on your check right if you need to. For getting an IFR clearance and route, you can start a VFR flight and then activate your previously filed IFR plan while en route. You would use this by checking the frequencies on your four flight charts and your radio call would sound something like Fort Worth Approach, Cessna 738 Uniform Yankee, 10 miles north of the field looking to pick up IFR to Wichita Mountain. Next, you could also do a pop-off IFR, which is obtained directly from Approach. In this case, you would say Approach Cessna 738 Uniform Yankee is 15 miles north of Denton at 4,000. Request pop-up IFR clearance to Wichita Mountain or wherever it is that you're flying. Kilo 2 is PIC Emergency Authority. 91.3 states responsibility and authority of the pilot in command. The pilot in command of an aircraft is directly responsible for and the final authority as to the operation of that aircraft. In an in-flight emergency requiring immediate action, the pilot in command may deviate from any rule to give way to the emergency, and each pilot in command who deviates from the rule under paragraph B in the section shall, upon the request of the administrator, write a written report of that deviation of the administrator. Kilo 3, Lost Communication Procedures. Remember, you can reference 91185 if you want to put this in your ACS, in case you forget. But it's important to stay predictable and flight the route that you're cleared to fly, and that if you arrive early, you can land early, as long as you feel that it's the safest thing to do. Remember to squawk 7600 and, if possible, fly into VFR conditions. If VFR conditions are not in range, then it would be important to follow the AVEF acronym. Assign vectored, expected, and filed. Make sure you stay above, at or above your MEA, which is the minimum altitude for IFR operations, the expected altitude if you can't fly into VFR, and your assigned altitude if flying a Victor Airway with an MEA that is different than your assigned altitude, climb to a higher of the two altitudes. Leave clearance limit, EFC, depart fix as close to the EFC as possible. If not at your fix, proceed to a fix and then fly the approach if possible. This all will go down to the Marvelous 500, but I have a different acronym, which is Cause Coffee, which is on 91183. These are going to be a compulsory reporting point, ATC direct, unforecasted weather, safety of flight, equipment failure. These are all radar envir environments. And then under non-radar environments would be another cons compulsory reporting point, outer markings, final approach fix, fix defining route, and your ETA plus or minus three degrees. Since we're on the subject of being VFR, let's review VFR airspace classes, which also is applicable to IFR. Class Alpha airspace, you must have only an IFR clearance. You cannot be in Class Alpha airspace VFR. Class Bravo airspace requires you to be three statute mile visibility and clear of clouds. Class Charlie is three statute miles, 500 feet below, 1,000 feet above, and 2,000 feet horizontally. Class Delta is three statute miles, 500 feet below, 1,000 feet above, 2,000 feet horizontally. And then in Class E airspace at less than 10,000 feet MSL is also three statute miles, 500 feet below, 1,000 feet above, 2,000 foot horizontally. But Class E at or above 10,000 feet MSL is five statute miles, 1,000 feet above, 1,000 feet below, and one mile horizontally. 
for your class G airspace, 1,200 feet or less AGL at day is one statue of mild clear clouds. Class G, 1,200 feet or less AGL at night, three statue at miles, 500 feet below, 1,000 feet above, 2,000 feet horizontally. Class G, more than 1,200 feet AGL, but less than 10,000 feet MSL at night is three statue of miles, 500 feet below, 1,000 feet above, 2,000 feet horizontally. Class G, more than 1,200 feet AGL, but less than 10,000 during the day is one statue at mile, 500 feet below, 1,000 feet above, 2,000 feet horizontally. And then Class G, more than 1,200 feet AGL at and above 10,000 feet MSL is five statue at miles, 1,000 feet below, 1,000 feet above, and one statue at mile horizontal. I'm going to review all those again with the simple acronyms that most of you guys understand already which is going to be F-111 and 3-152s. Class Alpha airspace is IFR only, no VFR. Class B, three statute miles clear of clouds. C, D, and E, less than 10,000 feet MSL, 3-152s. And then Class E, at or above 10,000, F-111. Class G, 1,200 feet or less AGL during the day is one statue mile clear of clouds. And then Class G at night, three statue at miles, 512. So three 152s. And then for higher than 10,000 feet MSL is going to be 5111. That was probably a mouthful, so I'm sorry in advance if that confused you. But just simply look up airspace classes and you'll find all the information on that. Now, specifically talking about instrument approaches, we're going to talk about Class E transition areas, which are highlighted on your sectional charts. You will generally see them on your VFR sectionals, and it's going to be a Class E transition area, which is extended from either 700 feet AGL or to 1200 feet AGL, which that'll be in blue, and then the 700 feet AGL is a magenta, and they're designated with airports for an approved instrument procedure. All right, let's move on to Bravo, which is holding procedures, air traffic control clearances and procedures. Elements related to holding procedures. A hold can be quickly added to a fix on the flight plan if assigned by ATC. Two weeks ago, I was flying with my instructor and we were told to hold off of a fix and I had to know exactly how to fly that fix. Keep in mind, I was already halfway down a DME arc so it's important that you review and that you chair fly these procedures so that you know how you would fly a holding pattern. You're going to have to explain to your DPE, okay, for this holding entry, which you'd probably ask you, how are you going to enter it? Or is it going to be a direct, a teardrop, or a parallel? So be able to explain how you would enter a holding procedure. Again, Flight Insight has great videos on how to get hold entries right every single time. The ACS holds a higher emphasis on the skills section on this specific part, so let's go over those. Your general hold limits are going to be plus or minus 10 knots, plus or minus 100 feet, plus or minus 10 degrees, and if you're tracking with a VOR, a maximum of three-fourths scale deflection. When it comes to wind correction, obviously steer into the wind. Comply with ATC reporting requirements. Be sure to announce entry into the hold, announce to air traffic control that you're holding at the fix at altitude that they allow, allow you to fly at, and then announce when leaving the hold fix on the inbound course unless you're already clear to land by air traffic control. When it comes to resources, you can just remember the acronym 5Ts, which is going to be turn, time, twist, throttle, and talk, which you're going to turn the aircraft to follow the entry. Note the time over the holding fix and start the timer when the wings are level or set a beam the point of intended hold. Twist the OBS into the inbound course and then adjust the power to maintain holding speed. Then you talk and advise ATC of the time and altitude when you've reached the holding fix. Again, all of these things are going to have to involve demonstrating SRM as given the Sierra 8 skill section. Remember the acronym for the six skills you need to be competent with effective SRM is CARATS, Controlled Flight into Terrain Awareness, Aeronautical Decision Making, Risk Management, Automation Management, Task Management, and Situational Awareness. All right, I'd like to shift briefly away from IFR, ACS, and speak mostly about instrument components and procedures. 
if you guys have stuck around all the way through the video till now thank you guys again so much for watching i really appreciate the help and i love making content so be sure to like comment subscribe if you like what i'm doing and i'll continue to make more for the future ratings to come all right let's brief on gps so there are 24 aviation satellites orbiting the earth minimum they are owned by the department of defense and there's a minimum of five satellites in view of all times three satellites provide 2d position four satellites provide 3d position five satellites give you RAIM, and six satellites allow wasp so what exactly are these things so RAIM is receiver autonomous integrity monitoring it requires again a minimum of five satellites RAIM is a minimum of five satellites and it forms integrity monitoring performed within the avionics system itself. It can identify satellite failure and alert pilots while flying. And without RAIM, a pilot has no assurance of accuracy with GPS. WAS, on the other hand, requires a minimum of six satellites, is always paired with GPS, and it improves accuracy, integrity, and availability of GPS signals. It allows you to have lower minimums on approaches, it provides additional measurement to the aircraft's receivers, improving the ability of GPS by providing additional satellites in view. Generally, WAS will be 95% accurate inside of a 25-foot bubble. So how does WAS work? Well, WAS is an interconnected system of GPS satellites connected to ground stations, then to master stations, then to ground uplinks, geostationary WAS satellites, and then to your aircraft. Let's talk about the ILS, the Instrument Landing System. The ILS is a precision approach with vertical and lateral guidance that can descend you down to minimums. The components of a ILS, you can remember GLAM, Glide Slope, Localizer, Approach Lighting System, and Marker Beacons. The Glide Slope will provide you with vertical guidance, therefore making it a precision approach, and if it fails, you should refer to the localizer only approach. The localizer will provide only lateral guidance and it is located on the departure end of the runway. It is four times more sensitive than the VOR and the coverage range will generally be 35 degrees to each side of center line within 10 nautical miles and 10 degrees of each line of center line within 18 nautical miles. If for whatever reason the localizer were to fail, then the approach is not authorized. There are a few different types of approach lighting systems, the first one being the ALS approach lighting system. It helps transition between instrument to visual approach and can help in estimating flight visibility if you know the dimensions of the ALS configuration. The approach lighting system starts at 2400 to 3000 feet from the runway. SALSR, simplified short approach lighting system with runway alignment indicator lights, ALSF, Approach Lighting System with Flashing Lights, and the MALSR, Medium Intensity Approach Lighting System with Runway Alignment Indicator Lights, are just a few of the approach lighting systems. When it comes to marker beacons, the outer marker will be generally four to seven miles out. It indicates where you should intercept the glide slope, and it is blue. The middle marker is gonna be about 3,500 feet from the runway. It's where the glide slope will meet the DA, it is 200 feet above touchdown and it is an amber color. And then the inner marker is the point at which the aircraft is on glide slope between the middle marker and the landing threshold. Generally, it's going to be 100 feet above category approach for CAT 2 and CAT 3 and it is white. Let's talk about when can you descend below the DA and the MDA. In 91, 175, all three states that must be met. The aircraft is in continuous position to land making normal maneuvers and normal rate of descent on the intended runway. Flight visibility is not less than visibility prescribed in a standard instrument approach and you must have one of the following in sight. The threshold, threshold markings, threshold lights, REILs, VASI, touchdown zone, touchdown zone markings, touchdown zone lights, runway, runway markings, or runway lights. So what is the MDA? An MDA is part of a non-precision approach and you are to go missed if you have no runway sight at the missed approach point. A DA or a DH, decision altitude or decision height, is only on precision approaches and you must have the runway in sight. You are to go missed if you do not see a runway environment. The DA is for CAT1 
approaches and DH is for CAT2 and CAT3 approaches. The VDP is the visual descent point. This is for non-precision approaches only. It is a point on a final approach course of a non-precision straightened procedure from which normal descent from the MDA to runway can be made with an adequate visual reference that we just went over. You are not to descend below the MDA prior to reaching the VDP, okay? You are not to descend below the minimum descent altitude prior to reaching the visual descent point. When you reach the visual descent point, you'll be able to follow a regular descent glide path to the runway. You may not be able to make normal maneuvers to land, and this is where you decide to go missed. Again, in a VDP is where you decide to go missed. You may be asked, what is the VDA? The visual descent angle is only, again, on a non-precision approach, and it provides the pilot with information required to establish a stabilized approach to descent from the final approach fix or step-down fix to threshold crossing height. Let's go over some acronyms. HAA is height above airport. HAT is height above threshold. The MSA is the minimum safe altitudes. Remember that for non-mountainous terrain is going to be 1,000 feet, and for mountainous terrain is going to be 2,000 feet. The TAAs, the terminal arrival areas, they're published on an RNAV approach, and they provide minimum altitudes you must maintain as you arrive from en route structure to the initial approach fix. There will be no minimum safe altitudes published, and it eliminates feeder routes, course reversals, and procedure turns. Once you're cleared for the approach, you can descend to the minimum altitude depicted in the defined area unless instructed otherwise. For GPS approach equipment, it must be certified for IFR approaches according to the TSO, the Technical Standard Order, and you must check the aircraft's flight manual. All right, let's talk about RNAV approaches. So we'll go ahead and talk about all the different types of approaches because this is such a huge part of instrument flying and you must know these things. All right, for types of RNAV approaches, reference the AIM 5-4-5. For your RNAV approaches, you're gonna have LNAV, LNAV plus V, LNAV, VNAV, LPV, and LP. LNAV is lateral navigation, LNAV plus V is lateral plus vertical navigation, LNAV, VNAV is lateral and vertical navigation, LPV is localizer performance with vertical, and LP is going to be localizer performance. Let's start with LNAV, which is just lateral navigation. You're going to have MDA minimums. You do not need WAS, and this will only provide lateral-only guidance. The integrity limit will be larger than localizer. The LNAV plus V is lateral plus vertical navigation, but this is strictly for reference. So you're still going to have MDA minimums. You're going to need WAS equipped GPS. For guidance, you will have lateral and advisory vertical. Like I mentioned, it's for advisory only, and it's going to be larger than localizer as well. For LNAV, VNAV, you're going to have lateral and vertical navigation. For this, you're going to have a DA, and you're going to need WAS as well. This will be lateral and vertical and larger than the ILS approach. The LPV is going to be localizer performance plus vertical. This is also going to have a DA, requires WAS, and it'll be lateral and vertical. It'll be pretty close to the ILS integrity limit. And then LP is localizer performance. This will have an MDA, WAS, and since it provides only lateral guidance, it'll be close to the localizer integrity limit. Now, let's go to even more depth about what WAS is. WAS will provide vertical and horizontal position. For a WAS approach, it will also provide glide path, and you may file GPS to the alternate, and the approach must have something other than GPS available to shoot a WAS approach. In the occurrence of a rain failure, you must pick a different approach, and if you're not in approach mode and a rain failure occurs prior to the final approach fix, do not descend to the DA or MDA must proceed and execute the missed approach. When it comes to the types of approaches, you're gonna have precision, non-precision, and APV approaches. So precision will provide you with vertical and lateral guidance. Again, it will provide you with vertical and lateral guidance in the form of a glide slope and a localizer. It's the most accurate and the ILS is the most common. 
in a non-precision approach, it will provide you only with lateral guidance to the runway and you must abide with all altitude or step down fix. An APV approach is an approach with vertical guidance. Now this will give you lateral guidance and vertical guidance with a glide slope, but even though it ha has a glide slope, it does not meet the criteria to be a precision approach like an LPV or LNAV VNAV. For a missed approach procedure, you must initiate going missed when you reach your DA or when you reach your MAP on a non-precision approach. It provides you with an obstacle clearance throughout the missed approach procedure and must and you must make sure that your plane is able to do it performance wise. If you have to execute the missed approach procedure prior to where the missed approach procedure is published, you must remain at or above the MDA to ensure obstacle clearance and continue to the missed approach point while climbing to the specific altitude written in the procedure. This is very important. If you're on the final approach on your check ride and you're examining, okay, go missed. You can't automatically initiate a left or right turn when you're still five miles away from the runway, right? Because that's not complying with obstacle clearance procedures. So be sure that you actually make it to the missed approach point before you decide to turn in a random direction and go missed. When it comes to procedure turns and course reversals, you may be asked, okay, so how far out are you going to go, right? You must remain within a 10 nautical mile distance from the fix, typically, and procedure turns establish you on an inbound course along with a hold in lieu and teardrops. You may be asked, when is no procedure turn required? For this, remember sharp TT. It's going to, you're not going to need a procedure turn whenever you're straight in, a hold in lieu, an arc, radar vectors, no procedure turn published, a teardrop, or a timed approach. Let's go over visual approaches and contact approaches. For a visual approach, it must be initiated by the pilot or air traffic control. You must have the airport and traffic in sight. You must have 1,000 feet AGL ceilings, three statute miles, and be clear of clouds. And radar services are terminated once you are handed off to the tower. For a contact approach, it must be requested by the pilot you need at least one statute mile of visibility and clear of clouds and an airport with standard or special instrument approaches. You must maintain an IFR clearance and traffic and obstruction becomes your responsibility. Timed approaches are established from holding fixes when many aircraft are waiting for an approach clearance and a controller doesn't necessarily have to specify that a timed approach is in process. The assigning of the time to depart the final approach fix inbound or order mar marker inbound for the approach indicates timed approaches are in use though. Once time is received, it's the pilot's job to adjust the holding pattern to cross the fix at the designated time given by the air traffic controller. For circling distances, remember that the category of your aircraft has to be referenced 1.3 times the VSO of your aircraft to consider your CAT A, B, C, D, and E category aircrafts. If you are missed approach while circling, if at any point when circling to land you lose visual reference of the airport, you must immediately go missed. You make an initial climbing turn towards the landing runway and then you maneuver it to intercept and fly the missed approach procedure. You must adhere to the clearance and that will keep you clear of obstacles. I'm going to brief over a few more terms and then we will go back to the ACS. So the ASR is the Airport Surveillance Radar. It's requested by the pilot for a non-precision instrument approach and it provides heading and distance information to the pilot from the controller. Then there's a PAR, Precision Approach Radar. It's initiated by the pilot. This is the precision instrument approach and ATC will provide the pilot with precise vertical, lateral, and range information. ATC will give you headings to fly. For a sidestep, there will be less than 1,200 feet apart followed by a straight in landing from runway to runway, and you're expected to make the maneuver as soon as you see the runway in sight. This maneuver will have a MDA, and it is important that you execute the missed approach procedure for the runway that you started on when you were to execute the missed approach, if you had to on this maneuver. For departure procedures, you can find this in the AIM 5-2-9, and 
find ODPs and SIDS. So let's talk about those. An ODP, an obstacle departure procedure, would generally be established at airports with high terrain or obstructions. In order to fly a departure procedure, the pilot must possess at least a textual description of the approved departure procedure. And if you're unable to fly, make sure that you put no DP or unusable in the remarks of your flight plan. And if the DP is accepted in a clearance, you must comply with it. The standard criteria for a departure procedure is the 234 rule, which is going to be climb at least 200 feet per minute. You must cross the departure under the runway of at least 3,500 feet and climb to 400 feet AGL before making any left or right turns. The SID is going to be the standard instrument departure and it will simplify a clearance from the air traffic controller to the pilot. It transitions you from terminal to en route structure, provides obstacle clearances, and is always printed graphically. You must receive an ATC clearance to fly a SID, and if you cannot comply, then be sure you put no star in remarks, and when you file, put SID first and then transitions via radar, RNAV, and that's going to be a SID. Next, we're going to talk about a STAR, a standard terminal arrival route. This will simplify an air traffic control clearance. It facilitates transition from en route structures to approaches. It will provide a lateral course, altitude, air speeds, and they will generally tell you descend via blank blank, cleared as published, cleared for, accept, or maintain altitude and air speeds. Let's go over low altitude FR charts. So your MTRs is going to be a military training route. It's going to be in brown, and it'll be it'll say IR. 1206 that'll be below 1500 feet AGL and if it says IR123 it's above 1500 feet AGL remember that federal airways are four nautical miles to each side of center line with the floor of 1200 feet AGL and Victor Airways it's going to be Victor 12 is going to be east and west airways and Victor 13 is going to be north and south airways and this will extend from 1,200 feet AGL up to, but not including, 1,800 feet MSL. For an RNAV route, a low-altitude RNAV route are going to be highlighted with a T, T route. A preferred IFR route can be found on ForeFlight. When you hit routes, you can find all the different preferred IFR routes on there that other pilots have previously been cleared for or have been given IFR clearances for to fly the route that you're trying to fly. And I'm not going to touch too much on jet routes because we're probably not flying jets. I at least fly a Cessna. They exist only in class A airspace and they are from 18,000 feet MSL to flight level 450. Let's talk about the different acronyms. So there's MEA, MOCA, MRA, MCA, MAA, and COP. So the MEA will ensure navigational signals are strong enough for reception and obstacle clearance. I'll say that again. MEA, signal and obstacle clearance. Communication is not guaranteed, and the altitude that you must maintain is 1,000 feet above non-mountainous terrain and 2,000 feet above mountainous areas. And the MOCA is going to be navigational reception ensured within 22 nautical miles of the nav A defining the route. The MRA is the lowest altitude at which an intersection can be determined from an off-course nav aid and the MCA is charted when a higher MEA route segment is approached, and the MCA is usually indicated when a pilot is approaching steeply rising terrain and obstacle clearance and or signal reception is compromised. MAA is going to be the highest altitude at which the airway can be flown with assurance of receiving adequate navigational systems. For example, you'll see a route that'll say MAA-10000, for a COP, that's going to be your changeover point. So if a changeover point doesn't appear on an airway, then the frequency should just be generally changed midway between the two facilities. For example, navigating between two different VORs. Be sure that you go through your IFR, TERPS, and ForeFlight legends and that you can understand what all these things on your charts mean because you're going to be given an IFR and route low altitude chart on your check ride, and your DP will probably say, hey, Tell me what this is. What does this do? How do I know where this is going? What does this little number mean? So be sure that you are brushed up and proficient with this information. Finally, guys, we are going to touch on aeronautical decision making and psychological factors. Thank you guys again for making it to the one hour mark. We're at 59 minutes and 30 seconds.
let's jump into the aromatical decision-making factors. Let's talk about spatial disorientation, which is one of the highest causing IFR consequences of not paying attention and staying ahead of the aircraft. You can remember ice flags, inversion illusions, Coriolis illusions, elevator illusions, a false horizon, leans, autokinesis, graveyard spiral, somatographic illusions. The inversion illusion will be abrupt changes from a climb to straighten level flight, which will feel as if you're tumbling. The Coriolis illusion will be caused by rapid head movements, and it'll set the endolf fluid in motion, creating the illusion of turning or accelerating on an entirely different axis. It may cause the pilot to think the aircraft is maneuvering a way that it is not. Elevator illusion is an abrupt change from a climb to straight and level, which will make the pilot feel as if you're tumbling backwards. A false horizon will be a sloping cloud formation or an obscured horizon or a dark scene with lights and stars, and it could provide an inaccurate visual information for aligning the aircraft correctly with the actual horizon. The pilot may place the plane in an unusual attitude by accident. L will be leans, abrupt recovery from a bank which will make you feel as if you are turning the opposite way, resulting in you turning back to where you first were turning and coming from. Autokinesis develops when stationary lights will appear to move when you're stared at it for many seconds, but you could try to align it with false movements of the light, which could place the aircraft in an unusual attitude. The graveyard spiral is when spatial disorientation occurs and you lose awareness of the aircraft's attitude. During a recovery to level flight, the pilot may experience a sensation of turning in the opposite direction, and you may return the aircraft to its original turn. Because an aircraft tends to lose altitude in turns, there could generally be a loss in altitude. The pilot will then try to pull further, which will tighten the turn and the airspeed of the aircraft, which could turn you into the ground. Somatographic illusion is the rapid acceleration which makes you feel as if you have a not high nose attitude. Again, I might have butchered that title, but I'm doing my best. Let's talk about optical illusions. So the runway width illusion will be when narrow runways create the illusion of an aircraft being higher than what it actually is, and it'll cause pilots to fly a lower approach than desired. Wider runways will create the illusion of the aircraft being lower than it actually is, and it'll cause the pilot to fly higher and possibly overshoot the runway. For a runway terrain slope, upsloping runways can create the illusion that the aircraft is higher, and downsloping can create the illusion that the aircraft is lower than it is. The black hole effect may create an illusion that the aircraft is at a higher altitude than it actually is by causing the pilot to fly lower than desired. Water refraction, which is why I do not suggest you fly in rain, the rain on the windshield can create an illusion of being at a higher altitude due to the horizon appearing lower than it is. This can cause the pilot to fly a lower approach. So how can you prevent optical illusions? Well, for this, of course, be aware of what these illusions are and how they can occur to you and in what situations they can occur to you. And be sure that you use chart supplements, that you understand the airport environment that you're flying to, and use and use VASIs and PAPIs if they are available to you. Again, this all ties into aeronautical decision making, which is part of the decide model to detect a problem estimate how severe it is, choose the best course of action, identify the solution, do what needs to be done, and evaluate if it helped your problem. Let's go over the PAVE, I'm safe, and personal minimum. So the PAVE checklist is going to be the pilot's health, physical, emotional, currency, and proficiency. Make sure you're safe. Aircraft will be airworthiness, performance, proper configuration. E is environment, airport conditions, terrain, and airspace, weather, and W craft, which you already went through. And E is going to be your external pressures, being pushed to fly somewhere, so you have to catch a wedding or an event. The I'm safe model will be illness, medication, stress, alcohol, fatigue, and eating or emotions. And it is important that you develop your own personal minimums because this can help you set up a go or no go decision. Your DPE might give you a scenario. Hey, so our passenger in the back is experiencing hypoxia. What are the different types of hypoxia and how do you identify them? Well, hypoxic hypoxia is the lack of oxygen due to high altitude. Hypemic means that you cannot carry adequate oxygen in the blood cells. Stagnant means there's a decreased circulation of blood flow. And histotoxic means that there's a decreased absorption due to drugs and alcohol. 
The passenger might be experiencing dizziness, euphoria, nausea, or belligerence. All right, guys, that's enough IFR reviewing for me. I think I covered essentially everything I wanted to know for myself. Hopefully, some of you guys can use this for your own checkride prep. I believe I went through it pretty well. But I'm, again, like I said, I'm using this as a personal guide, a personal reference. But I'm going to post this on YouTube just so that other people can follow along and don't have to talk into a microphone for one hour, five minutes, and four seconds. And you just have this already there for you to listen to while you're driving to work, while you're drinking coffee and enjoying your lunch, whatever it is that you're doing. So thank you guys for watching. I really appreciate you guys listening all the way through. If you made it, please make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Comment your favorite airplane if you have made it this far. That way I know you actually have made it this far. Thanks again. Have a wonderful rest of your day. I'm going to get healed up. I'm sick right now. Sorry if my voice sounded terrible. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys in the next video. Happy and safe flying, guys.